I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, we have a really neat show today. We only have one guest, but that's okay. Oh, but it's a great guest. Yes, yes. Our resident entomologist, Dr. Jonathan Larson, is going to be with us from the Department of Entomology. Jonathan, so glad you're going to be with us today. We're really excited to have you. Um, folks, if you have questions for Dr. Larson throughout today, use the chat function to interact with us. You can also hit us up via email at forestry.extension at uky.edu, and we can respond that way. But Renee, today we're going to be talking about insects and spring and how those come together. Together and how spring is impacting insects and their mm -hmm. development and growth. So, so I always wondered that, you know, where do they go? What do they do? And then all of a sudden it gets warm and they're, they're there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I'm seeing them out. So, mm -hmm. but so glad to have Dr. Larson with us. Um, I was going to say, Dr. Larson, I had a chance to see you last night. You were actually presenting last night up in Maysville. Nope. There was a bunch of folks up there and, uh, as, uh, and I know you're sharing the good knowledge there, but we really appreciate you taking some time, get down here and, uh, and share some knowledge with our audience and viewers as well. Of course, this is always a lot of fun to be on From the Woods today. Uh, I was actually perusing around on your fa your Facebook and on your YouTube the other day, just sort of like looking back through the years, things that I've talked about. So uh, I'm very fond of being able to come on your show. Yeah, well, well, we I, appreciate I, I, I was going to say along those lines, you know, and I, I don't want to kind of send people there now, but, you know, later when they want some more Dr. Larson, we've got a lot of him on this exactly. show. But, yeah, so you yeah. can go back and dig through the archives. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, I, I am excited to talk about spring and insects with you. I want to be clear, like, if you've got questions, you two, like, you can make this more conversational. It doesn't just have to be me waxing poetically about the beauty of our <laughs> oh, you are really good at that. But yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll be on our toes then. Yes. <laughs> uh, whatever you want to know. If I'm not saying it, I hope you'll tell me. Excellent. Um, and I'll, I'll ask our viewers to help us out too and kind of um, chime in along the way. Exactly. I was trying to prepare something today that would, I think, help to kind of talk about what you were alluding to, Renee, about it does. It seems like, you know, you go into winter, everything goes to bed, the insects seem to disappear. But then mm -hmm. in the spring, it's this, this switch that flips and you start to see some activity. And right. so populations of bugs are warming up right now. Uh, you can encounter lots of different life stages of various insects. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the biology of what's going on. Uh, it does connect well with the last topic that you had me speak on uh, a couple of weeks ago. We were talking right. about insect overwintering strategies. So I tried to, you know, go through all these different ways that insects avoid the cold. Uh, we talked about insect migration, how the things like the monarchs, they just pack up their bags and they go. Mm -hmm. How some insects like woolly bears, they can survive a certain level of freezing. They kind of push ice crystals to certain parts of their body, make antifreeze in their blood. Uh, we also talked about how some insects, they just move to protected areas that keep them safe from cold air temperatures. So we very rarely get free pest control from old man winter because all of the different insects, they've been around with winter just as long as we have as a species. So they have figured out all these tricks uh, kind of to help get through that colder period of time. But then you got to get out of the cold time into the warm time. I was looking around just to see what people sort of think about spring. Uh, mm -hmm. I looked up spring clip art, uh, and I, I noticed that in a lot of the clip art uh, that I was willing to steal, <laughs> this one I think uh, it's got some markings in the middle about what kind of, of image it is, but uh, all of the pictures that you can find the clip art, the sort of generalizations of spring, it includes lots of blooms, right? Lots mm -hmm. of tree leaves coming out, lots of rain and sunshine. But almost all of them also included various bugs, uh, as if the bugs were an important part of this. And that is because they're starting to wake up. Uh, and when I say wake up, I don't mean that they've literally been asleep or that they were in hibernation, like we think of with mammals and things of that nature. It's mm -hmm. a little bit different. They're arrested. Uh, so insects that are in this overwintering period, if they're adults, uh, they have they are chilled. And so they can't really move. When an insect gets cold enough, their body just isn't reacting the way they want it to. So they go into this kind of arrested diapause. Uh, and as it warms up, their body warms up. And then they're able to start wiggling around a bit and able to start walking around. And this is when the overwintering adults uh, that we experience a lot in our homes, that's when they're going to start moving and walking and touching things with their antenna. Uh, the spring also allows for the development of other stages, and I'll kind of go through that here towards the end about how insects that aren't overwintering as adults, they're in these other life stages, 
And those life stages need to progress in their development so that a larva can emerge or so an adult insect can emerge. And it all boils down to temperature. Like I said in the overwintering one, the lives of insects are really, really dominated by temperature. It drives almost everything about them. Uh, they need water. They need all these other climatic things. But temperature really dictates the pace at which they can go through their life stages. Well, is it true? Because I have always heard, you know, people were like, oh, if we have a bad winter, all of the You're bugs sure. will be gone, right. you know? So yeah. how true of a statement is that? It's not very true at all. Uh, it's it's not something that occurs truly. Uh, when we see the those polar vortexes, those Arctic blasts that come through, even when we get these negative 10, negative 14 degree temperatures, you have to remember we're walking around in the air. We're experiencing that cold air in different pockets in the ecosystem and the environment around. There's it's a lot warmer. It can be 30 or 40 degrees down in the soil, down in the leaf litter, uh, depending on where the sun shines. It can be even warmer. You may have this solar radiation that accumulates there. So the insects, they're in those protected spots. They're not going to get exposed to those negative temperatures. And even if they were, even if it was for a couple of hours one day, even a, a full day, most of them aren't going to succumb to that temperature because it takes a certain amount of time for them to freeze to death. The example I think I used before was bed bugs. Bed bugs have to be exposed to zero degrees Fahrenheit for at least five straight days in order to freeze to death. If you get any interruption to that zero degrees, it resets the clock a little bit. And so our outdoor temperatures, they go up, they go down. And right. so even yeah, when you get that super, you're not going to get right, that. <laughs> right, right. Well, and even in states that they do, like Minnesota, uh, the, the polar vortex, I think of 20, was it 17 or 16 that we had a really big blast? Uh, there was a period where it was negative 20, I think for uh, 48 straight hours. And they were, they were asking questions like, oh, did all the emerald ash borer freeze to death under the bark of the tree? And they found, a, I think, a little bit of mortality that the cold did seep in and zap some of them. But it takes time and it takes really sustained cold periods of temperature to get that free pest control. So no, unfortunately, uh, yeah, Jack Frost, Old Man Winter, none of the Santa Claus, they don't provide pest control, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I guess then are warmer te temperatures going to be better for them? I guess maybe it depends on some. Are you referring to uh, uh, climate change or, <laughs> uh, or the spring? Maybe a combination there. Maybe a combination of uh, yeah, I've got some stuff on on climate change here today as well. But yeah, ultimately it will help them. Uh, insects do a lot better in areas where it's warmer. If you go to the tropics, there's more diversity of insects. There's more generations of insects. Just look at Florida. Uh, it's a very buggy state because of their semi-tropical temperatures. And if we were ever to get you know that warm or even just any warmer than we already are, we will see changes to the types of insects that live here the numbers, the amount of damage. Kentucky is a very unique state. We're kind of that boundary water, the climatic right. transition zones, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons I like living here because we get Northern and Southern species and you get this just weird mixture of temperatures and weather and climate. Uh, if that ever goes away, we'll become more Southern, I would imagine. Uh, and we would start to see more patterns that are familiar from Tennessee and maybe like Northern Alabama in our state. Uh, but I'll, I'll try and parse through that here towards the end. Uh, let's get I, I, I did ask Renee if I could talk about climate change. Uh, she gave me the green lights. <laughs> Actually, all uh, right. But as we're settling into spring, as things are starting to sprout and bloom, I'm just looking out my window. It's rainy today, but you know you can see signs of life popping up uh, in various spots. Uh, if we start to look around, we would notice things. Some places starting to migrate back. We would notice things starting to walk around. Um, overwintered adults, uh, they may start to begin that migration back into places like North America. So the monarch butterfly will begin this activity soon, as will pests like the fall armyworm. They'll start to move north here in the next couple of months. Uh, but we can also look just in our, if you went out in the woods today uh, and started looking around in the leaf litter or under bark uh, on fallen logs, you would start to see things that are starting to wake up and move around, stretch their legs and get active. You can even do this in your home. Um, you may be noticing some of this overwintering breakage, uh, the, the stoppage of overwintering activity in your house, on your siding, on your deck. Uh, here are three examples that I can think of that I, I personally experienced in the last week. So a multicolored Asian lady beetle, 
an infamous household overwintering species. They're those kind of orangey brown ladybugs that you see in the home with uh, different numbers of spots. And here in the building that I work in on campus, we have lots of them that overwinter in Ag Science North, and they've been crazy active this week, uh, crawling out of the ceilings and taking flight just because we have had some of these warmer temperatures. I think we were in the 70s uh, at the start of the week. So that to them signals the fact that winter is ending. It's time to wake up and it's time to start to get moving, uh, maybe feed a little bit, but in particular mate and then produce the next generation. I uh, just had a cluster of box elder bugs that was apparently hiding out under my siding on my home. Uh, and they were coming out over the weekend in these big groups. And then brown marmorated stink bugs. They've been doing this for the last couple of weeks. This picture, I asked my wife for permission to share it because this is her toothbrush. If you look closely, you'll see two brown marmorated stink bugs hanging out uh, on the bristly portion of her toothbrush. I was speaking in Elizabethtown a couple weeks ago and I got this picture and she wanted to know why, why they were on her toothbrush. And I very excitedly said, maybe her mouth produces a brown marmorated stink bug aggregation pheromone. And she didn't think that was very funny, but uh, they, they're out walking around and they do sometimes end up on things like your toothbrush. They end up uh, in your clothes, they're on the floor. Uh, this can happen on any day above a certain temperature in winter. But once you start to get these sustained periods of warmth, that's when you're really going to see a lot of action as they start to come out and take flight and look for each other. But outside of those kind of pesty bugs, I did want to point out that spring is also known for having some, some kind of unique insects that are out and about and getting ready for the year. Uh, one of them that I really like to point out to folks is called the morning cloak butterfly. Uh, this for me is, I think, one of the more unique and beautiful butterfly species in our state. Uh, if you look here, you can see them with their wings open and then their wings closed. So if their wings are closed, they have this kind of scalloped edge to them, very camouflage-esque colors uh, on the underwing, that kind of mixture of brown and grays, so they blend in well with bark. They're intriguing because they overwinter as adults. Uh, we don't see this with a lot of Lepidoptera, with a lot of moths and butterflies, but the morning cloak is one of the butterflies that they will find an area to kind of cloister together out in the woods, and they hang out and avoid those cold air temperatures. And then even before the snow starts melting when the winter ends, they're up and about. They can get to flying uh, even on some of our cooler spring days, and you'd be able to see the rest of their coloration, which is this kind of unique combo of brown, yellow, and blue. They're also about four inches wide, so they're a fairly big butterfly species. This is one that's visiting some early spring flowers to get some nectar. You can see her proboscis sort of unfurling to go down into those flowers and get the nectar. But for me, that, that color combo, the, the yellow scalloped edges, the kind of deep brownish red color on the rest of the wings paired with those blue dots, it's very pretty. It's very interesting and unique. Uh, and it's only at this time of the year that you'd be seeing uh, those adults until we see the next generation grow up at the end of the summer. So an individual insect in this group, they can live for up to about a year. Uh, they like to fly around and look for things like elms, willows, and hackberries, as well as wild rose for their larval hosts. So these adults that are right now fluttering around, getting ready for the year, they'll mate. They'll probably get cold again. You know, we never have uh, uh, just a pure spring. We have these bursts of spring, and then it gets cold again, and then spring returns. Uh, they'll probably start to lay their eggs in that second uh, spring emergence, and then they'd be finding these trees that I mentioned. We have a few hackberries in the state, as far as I'm aware, uh, so it makes sense why we see them here in Kentucky. But then those caterpillars will hatch. They'll progress through the summer. Uh, they'll become adults in the fall and overwinter as adults themselves. We also have uh, what I would collectively call the punctuation mark butterflies that come out here in March and April. These are the question mark butterfly and then the eastern comma. Uh, again, you see this kind of scalloped edge to the wing, makes them look kind of like a leaf in profile, uh, even when the wings are open. They get their name, uh, not because of their favorite punctuation marks, but because entomologists, you know, we tend to be very literal when we name things. If we look on the outside of their wings, so the underwing, again, we see that kind of camouflage-esque pattern. But with these two species, we also see silvery shapes appear in the lower wing. 
And those are what give the different species their name. So if we look the question mark here on the left, it's a very generous description to call it a question mark. You kind of have the squiggle line on top and then the dot underneath. So that's the question mark here on the right. You can see kind of a silvery comma uh, that pops up on the lower part of the wing. So that's why they're the punctuation mark butterflies. But uh, these are both overwintering as adults right now. They're going to start to emerge. Uh, one of the really cool things about these, and probably one of the reasons that they're able to be a spring active species uh, in the way that they are, is that they don't just go to flowers. They preferentially will puddle or nectar at dung, rotten fruit, tree sap, and carrion. So they don't have to wait for the flowers to be in bloom. They can find a pile of deer dung or bear scat or whatever out in the woods, and they can actually get nutrition from it with their proboscis. Probably pretty hard to find rotten fruit right now, but tree sap is conceivable. You could find some oozing trees or weeping trees, and then everything's dying all the time. So there's carrion that they can stop at, and they'll just slurp up the kind of death juices from that dead animal, and they get what they need out of that material. Uh, in terms of what they're going to lay their eggs on, they also like elm, like our last species, and hackberry. They'll also use uh, various types of nettle. So if they can find some nettle growing, they will lay their eggs on that. The question mark butterfly is interesting because generally they're not a problem. They're just kind of out in the landscape. But anybody that's growing hops uh, kind of for their own micro brewing or if you're just trying to make a market for hops, uh, the, the, the question marks sometimes will pop up on that as a caterpillar pest uh, and kind of feed on those. Renee, Billy, have you ever found any of these various butterflies? out in the woods in the spring? Are you hanging out in the woods right now already? Uh, you know, we ha I haven't seen those exactly. And we were also kind of a little, uh, maybe it's not fair since we're not entomologists, but we were right. a little- uh, Questioning the question. question mark. Mark. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, very generous, right? Yeah. Semi-colored, maybe? Because <laughs> those look like pieces of bark almost, really. Right. You know? uh, yeah, so. Yeah, the uh, wings definitely are bark-like. I've always wondered why they didn't like. It's kind of like the eyebrow, maybe the eyebrow butterfly. Right. Uh, I don't know. Maybe this is also that just a bad. Because I'm sitting here going, we were both going, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's bark. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. But when you see a weird shape on it, you got to try and figure something out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I do like the part where they feed on dung and stuff. I think that makes them. Easy. Hey, that's an important thing. We need to get that out, right? Yeah, right. So. We both like that. <laughs> Uh, these are some other things that if you went out right now, you might be able to find a few of them. Uh, probably not today. It's a little overcast, a little coldy, but uh, there are social insects that are noticeable in the spring, uh, particularly because they're sending out sort of royalty. This is a bit of a parade of queens that you'll see in the spring. So social insects such as bumblebees, as well as yellow jackets, even larger insects like European hornets. Uh, the queens that are going to start colonies, they have overwintered uh, out in the soil. If you look, you can see that bumblebee kind of hanging out in the ground. That yellow patch of fur is sticking out. Here in the center, we have a southern yellow jacket queen. Uh, they look a little different than their workers because they're almost all yellow. And they're down in the leaf litter and hidden areas in the woods waiting out the winter. And then the same is true for European hornets. Those queens uh, that emerged last fall around October or November. They've been in these protected areas to avoid the cold air temperatures. But now that it's warming up, they're going to look for places where they can build their nests. Uh, depending on what species you're talking about or what group of these social insects, those can be in very different areas. So for example, bumblebees, the queen, when she comes out, she needs to forage and then find an abandoned rodent burrow. So they're going to find this hole that's been dug in the ground by a rabbit or what have you. Usually there's some fluff that's been left behind, some hair that's left behind in that nest. And they'll actually use that to kind of build the start of their nest. They'll create these egg chambers, which you're seeing her do on the left here. And initially it's just her. She's all alone as the queen. She lays her eggs. She tends to these new larvae. She has to build the rest of the nest and she forages. So in the spring, if you see bumblebees out and about up until probably about the end of April, the start of May, it's it's very possible you're looking at the queen uh, kind of working hard on her own, trying to get her colony started. And we get nervous about that because if she's killed, the whole nest is toast. 
And this is also the time of year where we have a lot of insecticides getting put down uh, for seasonal protection of various crops and plants, ornamental plants. And we're worried, you know, that queen, if she gets nailed with a spray or drinks some poison nectar from a plant, uh, there is the possibility that her whole colony just collapses uh, right there at the start of the season because it's just her. Uh, but as she kind of rears those first workers up, they'll take over a lot of the, the jobs in the hive and she'll specialize just on egg laying and she'll stay indoors after that and get the colony kind of humming along. Yellow jackets, they'll also build down in the soil, uh, but they can also be up in the air. They'll build in bushes. Uh, yellow jackets are much less picky than these other insects that we're kind of conversing about uh, where they're going to build their nest, actually. European hornets, uh, they tend to like tree hollows, but they'll also use your house or your shed in a pinch. This is the start of a European hornet colony. The queen has already reared up a few workers. You can see them hard at work uh, sort of creating a pulp that they use to expand the papery portion of the nest to cover up the tiers where the eggs are going to go. There'll be more and more levels of egg laying areas for the queen as they develop this. Uh, but it's a very sort of special time of year for them to get out and do this. And they're very susceptible, as I said, to perturbations in the environment. Uh, if they're harmed by a late frost or if there is some sort of insecticide that gets them, the whole colony will be toast at that point. Uh, the other things that you could go out in the woods and see waking up right now would be quite a few beetles. Um, there's a lot of fallen trees that become their own little kind of mini habit, habitats, uh, ecosystems. And uh, we find that a lot of beetles will specialize in using that if we're sticking just with the insects. You might also see millipedes and centipedes and all kinds of others that are avoiding those cold temperatures. But the beetles, it's really interesting to watch as you, if you peel off the bark, you'll see these adults that are just kind of chilling out underneath there, uh, waiting for the warmer air temperatures so they can start moving around again. Uh, they spend a lot of their life there in some cases. So I just picked two different species that I find interesting that are in the Kentucky woods. The one on the left, uh, that's the punctated ground beetle, uh, Scarates substratus. It is a, it's a little over half an inch long. They're a unique looking ground beetle because between their thoracic area, uh, part of their thoracic area and their abdomen, they have this ball joint. It looks kind of like your hip bone, like a coxa bone and a trochanter. And it, it's, it looks semi-rotational, but they also have really, really big jaws in the front. These are predaceous beetles. Uh, that seem to overwinter as adults, according to most of the scientific literature. We see the adults earlier in the woods and out in cornfields and soybean fields before we see other species of ground beetle. Uh, so it seems that they overwinter as adults or uh, they emerge at least earlier than the others so they can get a jump on them and kind of outcompete some of the other ground beetles. Uh, but they're important beneficial predators that are out in the landscape. The other one, the red one, that is a, a cucogid beetle or the flat bark beetles. If you look at it in profile, you'll it looks like it's been squished or like wily e. coyote has run it over with a, a paver. It, it has a very flattened profile, and that's because they live between the bark and the cambium layer. They're not pests. They just happen to dwell in there for their almost their entire life. And they eat things that pop up in their mites and other pests that show up inside of the wood. But uh, over the winter, they seem to overwinter in the adult stage. And so you'll see if you start peeling things back, you can find them in there. I think they're quite beautiful. Uh, they're very unique looking. They have kind of this arrow shaped head. But that's another one that if you were curious, if you wanted to do an insect spring safari, uh, this would be one that you could maybe put on your bingo card. Uh, it would be easier to find them at this time of year compared to later in the season. That brings me to sort of switch gears from talking about these adults that have been overwintered and that are just warming up. They're getting nice and toasty. Uh, they can get rid of the scarf and the gloves and the coat uh, to talking about other life stages that have been present over the winter. When insects uh, develop, you know, they have to start life in almost all cases as an egg. And the egg can hatch in the spring or the summer or the fall, or it can be the stage that they overwinter as. It can also, uh, we can also see pupa over winter. These are two life stages that they offer uh, some ease for overwintering, uh, just in regards to what the, what the insect is at that point in their life. Uh, it's important to sort of highlight how insects develop here. 
I'm pretty sure I've talked about this before uh, on From the Woods today, but just as a bit of a, a, a recovering of it, an insect will lay its eggs, and then depending on what kind of insect it is, they'll either go through complete or incomplete metamorphosis. These are the two terms most often applied to insect development. So on the left here, we have complete development. That's where they start as an egg, and from the egg hatches a larva. We have different names for larva, depending on what the insect will turn into. So for beetles, we use grub a lot. Grubs are baby beetles. Uh, if it was a, a butterfly or a, a cater or a, a butterfly or a moth, we would have a caterpillar. If it's a fly, we call it a maggot. The larval form, no matter its name, it's very different from the adult form. They typically live in wildly different areas than the adult form. They may feed on completely different materials. You know, think about a caterpillar versus an adult butterfly. Their mouths are entirely different. They go from chewing to siphoning as they develop. Uh, so it's very different. And there's an intermediary stage between the larval and adult form that we call a pupa. The pupa uh, is also important for overwintering. And I'll kind of go through that more here in a second. But it's this intermediary, usually immobile stage where there's a lot of changes happening inside of the pupa to have the resultant adult emerge uh, at some point during the growing season. On the other side of the aisle, we have eggs that hatch and they go through incomplete metamorphosis, which is where we have nymphs. Nymphs are, are immature insects that look a lot like their adult form. Here is a grasshopper example. So if you compare a baby grasshopper to an adult one, it, you can see it. You can see the family resemblance. There is uh, some similarities. The nymph is just much smaller than the adult and it lacks wings. As they grow, they get bigger and they will also develop from their wing pads. Their wings will start to get longer and longer till they're fully fledged pilots as adults and they get their wings and they're able to fly. Between these two kinds of development, you may see different life stages used for an advantage in winter. With incomplete metamorphosis, uh, we see a lot of them overwinter as eggs. And eggs are a really great life stage to spend the winter as because you don't really have to worry about anything. You have protection for yourself. You're in this egg case. There's also all the food that you need in order to be able to hatch from the egg. And your mom also usually takes care of you and puts you somewhere that is going to be semi-protected from those cold air temperatures. So this is a grasshopper laying her eggs. Uh, some of you may have seen this out in your gardens before or out in the fields. Uh, grasshoppers are known for, they, they will take their abdomen and they'll kind of bend it. And at the tip of their abdomen is their ovipositor, which is kind of a sword-like object that females have that lets them scoop or slice down into the soil most often. And then they'll kind of push their abdomen deep in the soil profile and they will unsheath their eggs. So you can see her above ground doing this. This is a diagram of kind of what that looks like underground. So you can see this grasshopper tucking her abdomen in, laying the eggs kind of in a row. Uh, they're kind of semi-covered with, a, I guess, a gelatinous goo a bit. And then she pulls her abdomen out. The eggs are left behind. The hole will get sealed as the soil kind of crumbles back together. And now you have an egg chamber that's underground, safe from the cold. And those eggs will be able to hatch the next spring and get going with their population. Sometimes the eggs are laid out in the open. We don't always see them underground or in leaf litter. So if we look on the left here, if you go and look in the trees in your landscape right now, some of you may find these kind of clusters of canister-like eggs. Uh, those are frequently going to be uh, things in the assassin bug group. These eggs in particular are immature wheel bugs. So those eggs will hatch, nymphal wheel bugs will start to crawl around, in the spring, as they feed, they get bigger. And this is the adult form, which some of you may have encountered before. Uh, two inch long, two and a half inch long insect with kind of a cog shape on its back. Uh, but those eggs right now, that's what you would find. They're laid in these kind of geometric patterns. Uh, their relatives, the stink bugs, also do this and a few other groups. Uh, but those will emerge, uh, open up in the spring. Other times, the eggs, they're not laid out in the open. They're not put down into substrate. The eggs are actually sort of protected by something that the mom makes out of her body that keeps the eggs safe from uh, the cold climate. On the right here, we have an uthika. This is a praying mantis egg case. It looks 
sort of like styrofoam insulation, like it's been sprayed on the plant. Inside of here are rows and rows and rows of eggs. Then the and the nymphal grass, not grasshoppers, nymphal mantises will pop out in the spring. If any of you have ever taken these inside, you've probably experienced this a little earlier than you anticipated. Uh, we sometimes have people try to rear up mantises from an utheca they find. And if they don't put it in the refrigerator or keep it in a jar outside, if they just keep it on the counter or their bookcase in their room, our heated homes, they speed up the development that they're going through and you get mantises in January. Uh, and then you got to do a lot of rearing to try and keep them alive or they're just going to eat each other uh, or maybe perish because you can't release them. Other eggs, egg cases can include cockroach egg cases, which look very similar to mantis egg cases. Uh, we see this with spotted lanternfly, the invasive species that you've heard me speak on before. The mom covers those eggs up and kind of a gooey material that hardens into a protective cover. We even see it with bagworms. Uh, bagworms lay their eggs inside of their bag so that that bag offers their, their future babies a little bit of protection. Uh, so there's a baby mantis that's hatched out of that Uthika. Very cute, very alien-like, looks very inquisitive as it stares at that human and wonders if it can eat it. The other type of development with a complete metamorphosis, when we have that pupil form introduced to the situation, the pupil form often becomes the, the reliant stage for overwintering. Uh, the pupil stage is also something that doesn't move. It doesn't need a lot of food. This is just a stage where the insect is recombining itself inside of the pupa form to become an adult. Uh, pupa are fascinating uh, to me as an entomologist at least. Uh, they're easy to observe because they're immobile. But if you look at them closely, they are this sort of weird mixture of their immature and adult stage. So my example here is a tomato hornworm. We have the tomato hornworm caterpillar on the left, uh, long greenish colored caterpillars that we see in the spring or in the summer as they feed on tomato plants. They have that uh, horn on the rear end that helps to differentiate them from other caterpillars. When they pupate, they will usually dig themselves down in the soil. They shed their last larval exoskeleton and out comes the pupa. When we look at the pupa, you can see some caterpillar-like traits, right? The rear end here, the abdomen section looks very caterpillar-like. The breathing holes resemble the breathing holes from the caterpillar stage. But up front, we can see the wings, this kind of folded over area. That's where the wings will start to develop. More interestingly, if you zoom in on the face, you can see where the antenna will form. So you see this indentation where the antenna will grow. If we look at the adult, you can see how they match up. This is the eye here underneath. And then that long trunk-like object in the front, that's their proboscis. It's forming inside of this tube. The pupa stage, it's, it's almost body horror. Uh, it's something that John Carpenter or any of the, uh, all the uh, uh, David Lynch, some of those other directors, I think they would really like reading about pupil development because inside of here, the body is liquefying into a soup. Like everything that made you a caterpillar is being rearranged, uh, I guess at the atomic level almost, so that you can become an adult moth. Uh, it's important to say that the pupa, it, the, the moth isn't inside of the pupa. It is a, a literal melting down of everything that the caterpillar was so that a moth can come out of here. The moth isn't hidden underneath there though until the end of the pupal stage. Uh, the pupa are also usually put in protected areas. The larva will crawl somewhere and then sort of get down in the soil or tuck themselves up somewhere so that they can get away from the cold air temperatures. Uh, they may perform a construction of a pupal chamber. So if you've ever been cutting wood and you have found this weird sort of circle or oval of chewed up wood material or slivers of wood, and it kind of has a hole in the center. That was probably a, a round-headed borer insect that uh, is a, a type of beetle that produced a pupil chamber. So they gather some of these slivers of wood they've created around them. They will secrete uh, a body liquid out and it will kind of clump up on that those wood slivers and now they have formed this protective barrier for their pupil form because they don't want things to be able to just walk up and eat them or lay their eggs in them. They've created kind of a wall between those predators and parasites uh, in their body. 
You can also see this down in the soil. So here's a pupil chamber that was constructed lower in the soil profile. You can even see the old larval skin underneath. Uh, this was a scientist that made a little terrarium. So they put two pieces of plexiglass fairly close together and filled it with sand so they could take this image, a lot like you would do with uh, an ant farm uh, that lets them to see this development that's happening underground. Other larvae, as they start to change into a pupa, they will produce a, an enormous amount of silk and they'll tie it together and they form a cocoon. Uh, they may even tie a leaf over it. On the right here, we have a cecropia moth cocoon and then inside is the pupal form, uh, the, the, the intermediary stage between the caterpillar and the adult. So when they are, it's time to emerge from the egg or to a close from your pupa, here you're seeing a cecropia moth as it closes, which is just what the scientific word we use to describe adult emergence from a pupal form. This is all dictated by temperature. When this happens, how quickly this happens, how successful you might be at this, uh, it all comes down to the temperatures that your life stages are being exposed to. And entomologists for the last couple hundred years have studied the effects of temperature on development. And this has led to the establishment of growing degree day parameters for insects. Growing degree days are used for trees and all kinds and plants and all kinds of other things as well. Uh, but when we use them for insects, it's very helpful to figure out when insects may start to come out. Uh, this can be for non-pests, but of course it's used pretty frequently to know when the bad bugs are going to show up. So what is a growing degree day? Renee and Billy were like psyching me up to be on the show today and they were saying all these compliments. And then I said I had math in my talk and their attitude cooled a little bit. So hopefully I can thread the needle here a little bit and talk about growing degree days and how we establish this. So when insects are developing, there is a sweet spot of temperature that's good for them, where their bodies will actually start to develop or continue to develop. But there is also an upper and lower threshold to that sweet zone. So above the upper threshold, so if it's hotter than say 85 degrees, they can't develop, it's too hot. So they have to sort of arrest themselves at that stage or they may die. Uh, there's also a lower threshold. So it's too cool for the body to develop. In between that upper and lower threshold though is that sweet spot. All the different temperatures, the different range that they will be able to actually continue development so that their body is, is, is growing and changing, uh, that the egg is starting to mature, that the pupa is starting to mature so they can get to the next stage of life. And scientists have established these thresholds for a lot of different species. Uh, this has been done through careful lab studies, field-based studies, lots of calculations. A lot of this is focused on pests because we wanna know when we're gonna deal with pests. So my example here is San Jose scale. San Jose scale can be a problem in apple orchards. They have an upper threshold of 90 degrees. So once it gets above 90 degrees, they can't develop. They have, they have to wait till it gets cooler again. They also have a lower threshold of 51 degrees Fahrenheit. So under that temperature, they can't develop anymore. But if it's any temperature in between those two, they're accumulating what we call growing degree days. This, I think, is where this can get a little confusing, I guess. A growing degree day isn't, you don't just get one if it's over 51 degrees, for example, with the, the San Jose scale. You can accumulate multiple, even many growing degree days in a given day. And I'll show you how that works with a calculation here in a second. But it's the total amount of heat that is required between the upper and lower thresholds for an organism to develop from one point to another in its life cycle. So we get these growing degree days that are gonna pop up in the spring, more in the summer, a little more sporadically in the fall, and then very rarely over the winter. And this results in this kind of stop and go development for different insects out in the wild. The example here is a cabbage white butterfly. There's a couple of different points in the year where they're accumulating growing degree days. So from the egg to hatch out, from the pupa to hatch out, to the larva to develop, to get to the pupal stage so that they can come out as an adult. Uh, all of this is calculated. It's, it, it is focused on pests. We have some for the non-pests, uh, but by and large, that's what you're gonna see. It's a measurement of heat units. Uh, it's not a measurement of calendar days, I think is the way to, to try and think about this. 
So there are more than one growing degree days in any given calendar day. Uh, we can have large bunches of development happen quickly if the temperature gets to a certain point. You can also have a lot of arrestment. You can have a, a slowing of that if it gets cool again. So we, this, we use this for prediction of specific life stages in an insect cycle. These growing degree day models, they help us with what we call integrated pest management. It helps us to know when to scout for pests, when to go out and start to do sanitation, when pests may be easiest to control uh, if there's still eggs and you just vacuum up a bunch of leaf litter that's in your garden, say, then you can get rid of those eggs before they hatch and you never deal with the pest. Uh, it can also help to guide us to know when to treat with pesticides. These two gentlemen on the right from Delaware, they're checking an, uh, a light trap. They go out and set this light trap up at a certain growing degree day to catch things like fall armyworm moths to know if they've arrived in their state. And then they will say, okay, we caught 12. Uh, that's enough to cross the threshold. And that means that in two weeks, you need to apply this pesticide to protect your corn. Uh, all of this kind of com combines together. These traps, the growing degree day models, the math, the bugs, the scientists, to help know when we can best get our pest control in that's going to be economically and environmentally sustainable. So there's multiple ways that we can calculate growing degree days. I'm going to show what we call the average method, which is kind of the simplest. If you don't want to learn about how to do this, you can also type in, uh, you can say growing degree days Fayette County into Google, and you'll be taken to the Mesonet map, uh, or the Mesonet site, uh, the climate site here for the University of Kentucky with our meteorological group. And you can pick your county and you can pick your starting date and ending date, and it'll tell you how many growing degree days you're at in your local area. So I put in Fayette County this morning to make this little chart here. We're at 77 growing degree days here uh, as of yesterday, March 5th, 2024. So we've had enough warmth this year that we're already up to this 77 growing degree days being accumulated over the course of two months and some change. Uh, to do the average method, you have to have the daily high and daily low temperature for the area that you're scouting. You add those together and then divide by two. And then for the average method, we just use the base model 50 to get the growing degree days in any given day. So yesterday you could take the high temperature and low temperature for your county or from your uh, temperature that you have on your farm or at your, uh, at your house. And then you add them together divide by two, and then minus 50, that gives you the growing degree days for that calendar day. So we might have a day that it was 75 degrees at the high, uh, 55 degrees at the low, add those together, divide by two. We use this lower developmental threshold of 50 uh, in the average method. Uh, you subtract the result from your parenthetical here by 50, you get 15 growing degree days. So a couple of days ago, that's what we had. We had 15 growing degree days because the temperatures pretty closely matched up with this. Sometimes when you do this, you may get a negative number. If it wasn't very warm, uh, but it was fairly cold, then uh, you, you might end up with a negative number. Uh, sometimes these numbers just get kind of jumbled up, but that doesn't mean the insects go backwards. That's just a day that insect development was halted. Does that make sense, Renee and Billy? Are you super bored hearing me talk about growing degree days? <laughs> Actually, Dr. Larson, we're fascinated yeah. by this, <laughs> and this is really cool. You know, it, it's I'm going back to my undergraduate degree here, and you you know you're refreshing some stuff that I learned many years ago. But it, it's really interesting. Um, you know, a quick question, and somebody had asked if you could put that link up. I don't know if you have quick access to that link. Yeah, here. I'll do that when I pop out of in, my the, talk. in the chat function. Yeah. yeah, so folks, um, he'll have that in there for us in a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, but I guess the quick question I had as I was looking at this, you know, you had mentioned that certain insects have I guess certain thresholds, right? When they can grow and stuff. So I'm wondering how this kind of accounts for the, that variation and different thresholds for different insects, this kind of average method. So this, yeah, this is the one that we, it's like the quick and dirty way of doing it. The 50 is is fairly standard for the, the lower developmental threshold. That's usually what we see with most species. If you wanted it to be more specific, you would have to look up your pest or your insect that you're concerned with. Uh, and probably find a paper that was published in 1968 or 69. <laughs> and then it would say, uh, you know, the lower developmental threshold for Kerm scale 
is 47 degrees. And if you wanted to be more specific, more precise, you would swap the 50 out for that. Uh, but it would require finding that kind of information. Generally, we just use the 50 because that's that's pretty uniform. They're not all like I San Jose scale is 51. This mm -hmm. is one degree less than that. But it, it gets you a good average, a good kind of one size fits all model. Great. It, it looks like um, one of our good friends and colleagues and put up that link for everybody. It should be in the chat function. Thank you, oh, Carl. Cool. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, Carl's taking care of us. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah, we're looking at this and I'm going, okay, how much was it yesterday? Yeah. Like, plus and the low and <laughs> trying so to think. If I go back here, uh, yesterday we got 10 growing degree days and then we had 13 on the 4th. Uh, we had 11 on, looks like, February 27th. So yeah, think about those warm days that we've had. Uh, mm -hmm. And those are the days that we've had growing degree day accumulation. Uh, I've been paying close attention to this because the College of Ag likes to put out an alert for when Eastern Tent Caterpillar has emerged. So all mm -hmm. the horse farmers know uh, mm -hmm. when that has happened. And they've been wanting to know, the people that write the update on it, they've been asking, they're like, oh, is it time? Is it time? And I said, yeah, probably actually about next week here in Fayette County. Uh, I checked out West as well. They probably already have eggs if you live out in Paducah. Uh, or Bowling Green, you probably already have the eggs hatching in those areas because you're in a slightly different climatic zone than we are. Okay, one quick question for, and then we'll let you get back to it. Oh, uh, thinking about, you know, is there like a, a certain number that we kind of, you all are looking for to where like the majority of insects are, you know, doing their thing? Is it 100 or is it 120 or right. 200? Unfortunately, it is, it is very species specific. I mean, we can say by the end of March, everything's probably getting going. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to get down into the weeds a little bit more, there are different requirements for different things. So uh, my example here, bagworms, bagworm eggs don't hatch until about, I think, 300 growing degree days. Whereas Eastern tent caterpillar, they need 90 to growing degree days. So they're, it's hard to generalize, but anywhere in between those two is usually uh, March, April, May, depending on what part of Kentucky you're in. So when we do generalize that, that's kind of how we do it. We just cluster it down to those spring months and say, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's probably going to happen somewhere in this window. <laughs> yeah. yeah, There's a lot going on, right? Yeah. It's just really happening. to see the science behind all sure, of this. Uh, yeah. I guess when I asked you to do the show, it never dawned on me how much science was actually oh, yeah. behind it. I, and I should have known that, but it just, you know. Well, it's, it's a science. It's so. <laughs> very interesting, though. I'm a, I'm a bug talker. We've got lots of pocket protectors and glasses that have sacrificed themselves <laughs> over the years to get all this information. Uh, it is, it is fascinating. I think insect, the interaction between insects and temperature, it's this, been this really fruitful field of study. Uh, it's not only led to growing degree days, but also these phenological indicators. Do you use this a lot in forestry to talk about when to go out and do things? Yes. Yeah. There are some indicators that we'll use. Yep. For sure. Yeah. Uh, some of them in, in, in entomology, it's, it's weird because you'll be talking about a species of insect and a species of tree or bush. And they usually aren't connected. It's just it just so happens that they do something at the same time. My example here is bagworms and catalpas. Bagworms aren't really catalpa pests, but bagworm eggs are hatching at vaguely the same time catalpa trees have reached full bloom. So if you look at a catalpa and you see all those beautiful flowers like we see on the left, you can be pretty sure that in your area that's around that tree, the bagworm eggs are also hatching. If that matters for you to go out and do some sort of control. Uh, we have lots of these phenological indicators. You can even find calendars where they'll kind of list them out. Uh, we have some on the UK entomology website. Uh, you'll see them in different extension publications. Mm -hmm. uh, the other example that I, the only one that's popping into my head is we have a pest of turf that's called annual bluegrass weevil. And the timing when the adults are most active in the spring happens to coincide with when forsythia bushes are half gold and half green. So half the flowers have fallen off. The other phenological indicators can be bud break, yeah. leaf fall, all these kinds of things. I mean, is this the same with forestry? Uh, yeah, probably not to that same extent, but yeah, there are some examples. Um, yeah, I had another question. I lost it. It was, it was so yeah. good. Yeah, let's come back to you. Yeah, yeah. Get back to it. Uh, but the growing degree days, you know, not everybody wants to sit down and calculate that out. Some of them prefer, some people prefer the phenological indicators. 
because it's something that you you notice in and around the area that you're growing something. Uh, it is good to use kind of localized plants if you're going to use phenological indicators. I try to tell people if you live on one side of town or one side of the county, what you're noticing there, uh, if you drive over to your tree stand or if you go to visit a different county uh, to go out into the woods or what have you, it, it's a different microclimate. Uh, so you have to look more locally to see those phenological indicators. You can't trust what's in your backyard to tell you what's happening a county or two away. That brings me to, I guess, the most controversial part of my presentation uh, that maybe some people will have some thoughts on. But I, I wanted to point out that all of this that I've presented is in a state of flux, unfortunately. Uh, we have all these carefully constructed growing degree day models. We have all these phenological indicators. But unfortunately, everything is kind of in a boggle box right now, getting shaken up by climatic variability, by climate change. The world is getting warmer. If you look at the data, we have noticed increases in temperature across the world. This is going to have impacts on insects and their development. Uh, we alluded to this kind of at the start when Renee was asking some questions about, you know, when bugs get warm, what's going to happen? If it gets hotter, then they're going to be more successful, frankly. Uh, some species will be more successful and other species will be less successful. Uh, climate scientists have also just flat out noticed that springs are arriving earlier. I don't know about you, but I wasn't expecting uh, a 75 degree day before a leap day uh, here in 2024. Uh, summer is also lasting longer. And because of this, you're seeing this extended growing season, which is going to not only be afforded to plants, but be afforded to insects. There's also a variability day to day where you have these sometimes extreme swings in temperature. We've also seen upticks in extreme weather events. All we have to do is think of Kentucky over the last few years and some of the floods that we've experienced, uh, the tornadoes that have appeared on days that are seemingly outside of the normal tor tornado schedule. All of this could happen more. Think of states like Florida. They're, ex they're experiencing extended hurricane seasons as well. We're having warmer on average winters, uh, or at least winters have featured less snow and more rain. Uh, I have often grumbled over the last two winters on rainy days in December and January about how this should all be snow and we should get a snow day. But unfortunately, it's coming down as a different form of precipitation. This data that you see here is from 1895 to 2017, showing how winter has changed. Kentucky doesn't seem to have altered a whole lot. Uh, our more northern states are the ones that have experienced more extreme shifts in their winter temperatures on average. But you can see if you go down to February, we do have some changes here in Kentucky. Uh, we have more red areas, uh, according to this map, which means that spring is arriving sooner rather than later. Uh, this has all been kind of epitomized, I think, in the 2023 USDA plant hardiness zone map update, which changed all of the states. Like we have new growing zones that people are living in. I used to live in Nebraska and I had all, I have all these Nebraska Facebook friends and they were cheering because they went from zones four or five all the way into six in some cases in that state, which is a big swing temperature wise. And they were talking about all the new plants. This means that they can plant, uh, but seemingly we're ignoring the part about that. That is hard evidence of climate change. If it's that much warmer in Nebraska that you can bring in uh, a crepe myrtle, possibly that's a big shift. Kentucky has experienced this as well. Our state also changed. Uh, we have more of the state in the 7A and 6B zone uh, rather than in just the, the 6A. So it's, it's a big shift and it's going to have consequences not only for the plants that we grow, but for the bugs. We may deal with higher populations of insects more generally. The warmer it is, the more successful insects tend to be. So there just might be more activity. Uh, there might not just be more insects overall, but there will be more generations per year. Uh, think of things like mosquitoes. You may deal on a normal year uh, back in 1989, you get out of your Smokey and the Bandit Trans Am, uh, you're only going to experience one to two generations of mosquitoes in a growing season. But now we're up to three or four potentially because it's warmer for longer. They can squeeze more in. That may not seem like it has serious consequences, but it can mean things for plant pests. Uh, it can mean things for insecticide applications as well. Also would point out that if winters are less arduous, as we've sort of talked about with Kentucky a second ago, 
This could change migration patterns of insects. Migratory pests, such as the fall armyworm and potato leafhoppers, they may be able to survive further north instead of just being down in the southern tips of Texas or Florida. Maybe they're all the way up into Mississippi and Alabama over the winter, and they get here faster, meaning we deal with pest problems for a more prolonged period in the state. We already experienced this with fall armyworm back in 2021. They overwintered much further north than we were used to because of a warmer winter that year, and they got a jump start on getting up to states like Kentucky. They actually arrived here a full month and a week earlier than they usually do, just because they had that head start uh, based on their overwintering habitat. We've talked about winter mortality rarely causing local pest population el elimination, but the more extreme weather events that we have, the less snow that we have, the more, I guess, perturbations we're gonna see to this overall system. Snow does protect insects that are in the ground. It provides an extra layer of insulation. So some insects are losing that and they may freeze to death as a result. So some of my answers could change uh, to what Renee asked me about, does winter kill bugs? So there could be certain pests that are destroyed. It can also just create hard to predict problems. The growing degree day models, the phenology models that I've mentioned, they're sort of crystal balls that help us to know what is going to come up in a more normalized pattern. But those models are all shifting under our feet. We may not know what to say in states like Kentucky uh, until things settle down and we're able to reestablish and reevaluate these types of models. Uh, we've also seen that pests are going to do better in the coming world. Uh, there was some research in New York City after Hurricane Sandy that showed uh, extreme weather events favor pests and invasive species. So they already survive in high stress environments. And when we have more stress added due to flooding or tornadoes or really heavy thunderstorms or hurricanes, the pests are what come back faster and can outcompete some of the, the native organisms or the non-pest organisms in an area. This also can be very layered. It may not impact the pests directly, it may impact their hosts. So we might see shifts in what forests look like. Uh, the ranges of trees could change in certain states, which is gonna open up new niches for pests to feed on uh, or make pests go away even potentially because there's just no more food for them. This could also be true for beneficial organisms, unfortunately. Beneficial organisms suffer from these kind of changes more easily than pests do. And so all of these changes to the climate, it may cause this mismatch between something like a wasp that lays its egg in a grub. They may not be able to develop as quickly as the grub. And so the grub gets a head start and they're at a stage where the wasp can't sting them and lay their eggs inside of them anymore. We've missed that biological control window because of these changes to temperature. Uh, the, the natural enemies, they just don't recover from these things as easily. And so once these changes start to happen, we could see localized extinctions. Uh, we could see host shifts. We could see all kinds of problems kind of cascade down from these climatic changes. We've already observed this in urbanized areas. Uh, cities offer sort of a look at the temperature that we might see in certain states in the future. Uh, a city like Louisville is already several degrees hotter on average than the more suburbanized or rural counties around it. And so we can use those as models. NC State has done some great work on this and shown that city trees, they deal with higher pest loads uh, because those pests are escaping their natural enemies. They outdevelop them. They outcompete them because of this beneficial heat that they're getting. I don't wanna take, up, take us up all the way to the end. So I'll just kind of skip ahead and talk about how these changes are already occurring. We're seeing host shifts with native species. We're seeing phenologies change, which means that insecticide applications are going to have to adapt. A lot of the things that you've read about in the past, they may get changed here in the next few years, particularly in a state like Kentucky, which is already sort of the transitional zone. If we lose our transitional status, we may have to start using models that were developed in, in other states to be able to stay uh, relevant. So I uh, ended kind of on a downer. I apologize, <laughs> but uh, right. I, I thought it was important to bring up. No, that that was really an awesome presentation. <laughs> I'm like, 
I wish this show was long. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm like, it's really good stuff. I um, got too poetic earlier about the commas and the questions. We uh, we interacted maybe a little bit too much with you. There was a couple of quick little questions. Um, somebody did ask um about um repeating what you had said about the fall leaves and habitat. You know, I know my wife gets on me a lot about not raking up the leaves and stuff too soon and stuff like that. I don't know if you want to make a quick comment on that. Yeah, I would love to. So yeah, when we see people rake out their yard or leaf blow their yard they bundle all that up there are there are a bunch of bugs in there there's eggs in there there's pupa in there uh and then that gets carted off to the dump and it gets destroyed uh, i do encourage people if you like to conserve nature to keep some of the leaf litter to push the leaf litter to the side uh to to not destroy it like that i mean it's not every leaf and i understand you want to maintain a nice yard but they are biodegradable uh, they, they are part of the environment. They've existed before our yards and, and they will exist after them. So uh, there is a lot of natural life that's kind of hidden under there. And if you take that blanket away, certain things won't be able to overwinter. And you're also killing eggs and pupa that are hidden in there. Okay, good lesson. So yeah. I, I guess I should listen to my wife. Right? <laughs> that would like yeah. it. All right, like and it. I think one quick one. Um, can this, you know, talking about the variability in temperature and stuff like that, they were asking about the negative impact on insects. You know, for example, bees coming out early and then we get a, a cold snap. Just maybe a quick comment on that. Yeah, uh, we do worry about that. You know, I think about the last two springs. We had this like jump start spring in February and early March. And then I remember, uh, I think it was two years ago, I went to go out and start a sampling protocol for a certain pest, and I had to dig through snow in April to get to the bugs. So when we have those weird things, yeah, there are impacts on insects. Uh, we talked about how they don't freeze to death easily, but if it's this freak event, uh, weird variability, and they're already in kind of a prone stage, like coming out of the overwintering, any delay in getting to food or to one another that can snap their their life cycle, snap their ability to survive. It could just straight up kill them. They could get frozen and, and die. So yeah, those those kind of events do happen. Renee looks like she's rooting for it. On oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the bug, <laughs> the mosquitoes. Yeah, I'd love for them to just be gone. Yeah, the, the beetle picture at the end might have been a bit much too for you. Yeah, yeah, all the beetles you had. That, yeah, it was like. Oh. That's like yeah. a nightmare. <laughs> Sorry. All right. All right. So again, Dr. Larson, can't thank yeah. you enough. We would love to sit here all afternoon with you and keep talking with you, but we're going to kind of let everybody go for now. But we certainly will have you back again. You Definitely. know, it's always a pleasure having Dr. Larson. He does such a good job um, of kind of highlighting things that I think a lot of us, you know, maybe take for granted or don't even think about all the time. Right. Definitely. And if you, you know, he's been on here a lot. So if there's any shows that you want to see, you can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and you can see shows that he's done in the past. Yeah, no doubt. And we all have our survey up now on there, too. If you do have any um, requests, show requests or ideals you think people would like to see, um, please let us know. You know, yeah. we want to be good servants to you all. We want to help you all be supportive and taking care of our woodlands and wildlife and natural resources here in Kentucky. But thank you all for being with us today. We certainly appreciate you. We definitely do. And we will see you next week at 11 o'clock. Take right. care. Bye. Bye. Everybody. From the woods today.